This is John Deaton. I'm running a candidate for U.S. Senate in Massachusetts, running against Elizabeth Warren, and confident I'll be the next U.S. Senator in Massachusetts. What motivated you to run for the U.S. Senate, and what key issues do you aim to address as elected? Well, the key issues, I'll start with that because that relates to why I decided to run. Uh, Massachusetts is actually ground zero in all the issues facing the country. Illegal immigration, a lot of people wouldn't think Massachusetts would be ground zero, but we have a right to shelter law, which doesn't require residency, which means if you show up in Massachusetts and you're homeless, the, the government, the state government will house you and feed you. And it's costing the state over a billion dollars a year. Uh, there's a debt crisis. Almost 40% of Americans don't have $500 set aside in case of an emergency. On top of that, uh, with obviously the government's $34 trillion in debt, credit card debts at $1.1 trillion, and student loan debts at $1.6 trillion, and, and it's out of control. On top of that, we have inflation. Massachusetts is either the second or third most expensive state in the country to live. Housing is the third most expensive to live in the country. And then we have foreign wars, you know, whether it's Iran and the Houthis in the Red Sea or Israel and Gaza with Hamas or whether it's Ukraine and Russia. But all of those crises pale in comparison to the greatest crisis of all, which is a crisis of leadership in Washington, D.C., because elites like Elizabeth Warren, they sit back, they fuel division, they keep us, you know, pointing the finger at each side and not getting the job done. And so when you look at the Senate, you don't see a regular person. You don't see someone who overcame poverty like I did. You don't see someone who struggled to pay his bills like I have. You don't see a small business man like me. I am the American dream, and I represent that, and I think it's in jeopardy. I see it dying, and I got in this race to preserve the American dream. How do you plan to influence the currency regulation if you're elected to the Senate? Well, I believe I've already influenced it, and I'll tell you how. I sued the SEC. I was the first one to do it uh, in the Ripple case uh, over when the SEC claimed that all XRP uh, tokens were securities uh, and illegal. I sued the SEC. I became amicus counsel, and I won. Judge Torres agreed with me and ruled that XRP itself is not a security. That case has been cited uh, through and through, and it's impacting legislation. I was amicus counsel in the library case uh, for Naomi Brockwell, an independent journalist, and the judge agreed with me on the record that secondary market sales wouldn't be impacted. And I'm amicus counsel in the Coinbase case on behalf of customers. So I've been impacting this, and I did that all pro bono. I've never been paid a dime for any of the work I've done for crypto token holders. I represent the individual retail token holders, not the businesses. I don't represent Coinbase. I represent their customers. I don't represent Ripple. I represent XRP holders. I didn't represent Library, the company. I represented the token holder uh, who owned the token didn't use it like a security. And so I've been doing that. Once I get to the Senate, I'm going to support legislation that actually helps improve the U.S. dollar's dominance as the world's reserve currency. And there's ways to do that. Crypto is not a threat to the U.S. dollar. It can actually bolster it by stable coin legislation and things like that. So we want to punish fraudsters. We want to punish the bad guys like the FTXs and the San Bacon Freeds of the world, but also have legislation that encourages um, innovation. And where I live, Massachusetts, when innovation and technology is advanced, we always win. We're always, Massachusetts is always the leader in technological advances. And so that's how I'm going to impact. I already have. Obviously, when I become a senator, I'll even have a more powerful platform to do it. In your opinion, what are the most significant flaws in the SEC's approach to regulate, regulating cryptocurrency? It's the regulation by enforcement where uh, they're just taking this approach. Gary Gensler, the, the problem is politics have gotten away. Gary Gensler stated when he was sworn in as SEC chair that exchanges like Coinbase, Kraken uh, did not fit under the SEC's jurisdiction. He said that under oath. 
Then he got his marching orders from Senator Elizabeth Warren, my opponent, and he immediately changed. To give you an idea, and your uh, readers an idea, in 2021, the SEC approved Coinbase's IPO and even, and even made a determination to advance it, to accelerate it, which meant they had to decide it was in the public's best interest. Two years later, Gary Gensler and the SEC claimed Coinbase's entire business model was illegal. How could you say it's in the public's best interest two years ago and then say it's completely illegal two years later? And so their approach is a political approach. They've decided to go all in against the anti-crypto. But the bigger problem we have after that is that we're trying to apply 1933 law to blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation. So Congress has to do their job and apply and make laws related to digital assets, the tokenization of real world assets, uh, about what's a security, what's a commodity, and things like that. But right now, it's everything is a security approach because they're pursuing a political agenda. You call for the resignation of SEC Chairman Gary Gensler. What specific changes do you believe are necessary within the SEC to better regulate the cryptocurrency industry? Well, the first thing they need to do is provide guidance of what. You know, let's look at the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom's financial conduct agency, FCA, a long time ago labeled three type of categories for tokens. They said there are security tokens, there are exchange tokens, and there are utility tokens. And then they said, here are the guidelines. This is what makes it a security. This is what makes it a utility token. And this is what makes it an exchange token. For example, they labeled XRP not a security token, but an exchange, a hybrid between an exchange and a utility token, whereas the SEC called it a security. And so if you have clear guidance, like these are the markers, if you meet these markers, let's call them decentralized markers. If you meet these markers, then it is not a security and it'll be governed by the CFT. Uh, com it's a commodity. It's not that hard to do, but because they want to pursue politics and a political agenda, they're treating everything like a security. What do you envision as the ideal regulatory framework for cryptocurrency in the USA? It would be that um, what I just said, where they say the SEC and the CFTC get together and they say this is what constitutes under current law a security and they list it out one two three four five these five things make it a security everything else will be classified a commodity and will be governed by the cftc right now you have too many agencies with their hands in the pot you've got treasury cftc sec finra you've got the uh, financial fincip uh, there's like six seven agencies that all can claim some kind of jurisdiction to one asset class. For example, XRP, uh, in 2015, FinCEN said it was virtual currency. Uh, other agencies called it virtual currency, not a security. And then seven years later, the SEC came along and called it a security. So we need to designate which agency is going to govern the asset class. That's a must. For the next set of questions, uh, they're going to be a little bit more general, okay. but you are, can feel free to so, dive back, obviously. Yeah. Can you share your perspective on the most significant developments in the blockchain space over the past year? The most significant development would be the spot Bitcoin ETF, uh, where Larry Fink and BlackRock, as the largest asset manager in the world, uh, basically said that Bitcoin is a safe haven asset and the spot ETF now is the most successful spot ETF in the history of the world. When Larry Fink and BlackRock get involved, the rest of the Wall Street and the rest of the market is going to follow. 
So to me, that by far is probably the biggest significant event, and it also led to the SEC approving the Ethereum spot ETF. So what that means is crypto has been adopted by mainstream Wall Street, which means it is here to stay as an asset class. How do you see the role of traditional finance institutions evolving with the rise of decentralized finance and blockchain technology? Well, I, I think that what we're seeing with BlackRock is traditional finance is seeing that there is this real appetite for this asset class. One of five Americans own crypto, right? Now with the spot ETF being approved, it went from 50 million to 80 million Americans own or have exposure to this asset class. So what I think we're going to see is we're going to see traditional finance get in the services as custody, Bitcoin custody, other crypto asset custodies. I think that they're going to um, become invested in the infrastructure of DeFi. And it's just, listen, it's the traditional thing of they laugh at you, they don't take you serious. Once they start taking you serious, Right after they can't ignore you, they laugh at you, then they fight you and they send the regulators on you. The Treasury, the SEC, all the governments, you see how choke point 2.0, they were hurting the bank. Any banking that was doing business with crypto was uh, being penalized. So now they're adopting you. And that's we're in the stage between fighting and adopting right now. I throw all this a rhetorical question, but how do you see the biggest challenge? facing the adoption of blockchain technology and how can the industry overcome them? The industry can overcome it by going to johndeatonforsenate.com and uh, donating and taking out the single biggest corporate of the industry. Elizabeth Warren, when she decided to run, said she was building an anti-crypto army. Uh, and so taking her out will be the biggest uh, win the industry can have. I know that was self-serving, but that's my honest answer. How do you envision the future of Web3 and what impact do you think it will have on the internet as you know it? Well, I, I'm someone who believes since 2016 that um, there was a legitimate argument that blockchain, crypto, Web3 would be bigger than the internet. And I think that, that uh, it hasn't been proven yet, but I think it's on its way. And, and I think that... Um, even at this conference, we're at consensus. If you compare last year to this year, it is a completely different atmosphere. Last year, it was more negative. The regulation, FTX had happened. This year, it's all about more energy. I think that the White House just yesterday pivoted. They went from an anti-crypto platform to, we're willing to work with you. So they went from, we're going to fight you, to we're willing to work for you. That's what I meant about we're in that fight adoption stage. And so I think Web3 has a huge future. Amazing. What advice would you give to new entrepreneurs entering the blockchain and crypto space? The the, the biggest advice is that is is to not rush because I think that um, we may see a, another stage of people because when things become optimistic, sometimes there's a rush and projects get rushed and people are racing to be relevant too fast. I think five years from now, America will be number one in this technological uh, race, if you will. Right now, we're not, but I believe we will be. As far as investing goes, I'm not an investment advisor, but at this point, I think it would be very um, unfortunate, right? I'm not going to say words like dumb or anything like that, but unfortunate is someone didn't have some exposure to the asset class. That doesn't mean that you go all in, but if we're going, how do you not at this point have, you know, 1% exposure uh, of your investment portfolio into this asset class? Whether that just means Bitcoin or it means more than Bitcoin, I don't know. That's up to other people. But I think right now, if you're a asset manager or you're a financial advisor, I don't see how you put and say to your client, you know, why don't you put one to five percent of uh, your investment into this asset class? Uh, that was great. Um, this concludes the interview. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask or would like you to ask or that you want to share? 
No, I, I think uh, I would just add this that I'm really not a pro crypto candidate. I'm a pro freedom candidate, and and I believe in a level playing field and the best technology winning, and um, and that the government shouldn't tell you what you can own and what you can't own. And uh, the last thing I would tell you is that in 1980, Massachusetts, their regulator was someone like Elizabeth Warren, and they prevented retail holders from buying Apple stock from the Apple IPO. Think that was a mistake? I think so, because $1,000 back then today would be worth millions in Apple stock. And so the government has to get out of telling people how they can live their lives.